Our chief guest, Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, Honorable Betty Maina, Principal Secretary for Industrialization, Dr. Francis Owino, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers Board Chair, CEO, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of the 2021 Manufacturing Priority Agenda virtual event, bringing together representatives from the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, and private sector players. The Manufacturing Priority Agenda is a yearly document produced by the Kenya Association of Manufacturers to guide the association's advocacy agenda throughout the year. The 2021 MPE, MPA theme is from surviving COVID-19 to thriving manufacturing sector rebound for sustained job creation and investment growth. Of course, you know very well the global outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic turned to be not only a health, but an economic crisis. The containment measures put in place to avert the spread of the virus caused global supply chain disruptions and reduced consumer spending, resulting in a global economic slowdown. And just to give us a picture, I really want to celebrate the Kenyan spirit and Madam CS, you mention it. It's the can-do spirit that Kenyans have. It has been a hard work. It continues to be hard work. IMA, which is one of the most important financial institutions, predicted doom for the global economy. We were expected to grow at a negative 1%, but now our growth is at 2.6% the highest in Africa. There is a Kenyan often saying, you know, I think your car breaks down on the side of the road in a small village and somebody shows up, those cars that you could fix and you explain and they tell you, e, in our Zekana. And it's a guy who just you know, came out from nowhere. But I think that can do attitude of Kenya is what has saved us during this period. We've got a very, very positive attitude and we have taken this opportunity to construct ourselves. The new normal in Kenya and the world can only be defined as a known unknown. We know the extent of COVID disruption and the kind of havoc it has wrecked and can wreck. But we don't know how the disease will morph in the future and how the new normal will unfold. The new normal, ladies and gentlemen. The new normal. And of course, that's why through this webinar, we seek to, number one, disseminate CAM's proposals on accelerating the recovery of the manufacturing sector in Kenya. And number two, elicit discussions among state and non-state actors on accelerating the recovery of the manufacturing sector in Kenya. That's why we need you to kindly post your questions and comments on the chat box to enable further engagement towards the tail end of this webinar. And to give us the welcoming remarks, please welcome the Kenya Association of Manufacturers Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Phyllis Wakiaga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wakati. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mokazi, for the warm welcome and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you all this morning as we launch the Manufacturing Priority Agenda for 2021. And this agenda is an annual guide that really guides the advocacy of the association throughout the year. So allow me to begin by recognizing those who have taken time to join us this morning. I want to appreciate our chief guest, the Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, Honorable Betty Maina, the Principal Secretary for Industrialization, Dr. Francis Owino, the other PSs who have confirmed, and I know they'll be joining, the PS ICT and Innovation, Mr. Jerome Chiang, the PS East African Community, Dr. Kevin Desai, the IMF Resident Representative, Mr. Tobias Rasmussen, I also want to appreciate our board chair, Mushai Kuniha, our vice chair, Mr. Rajan Shah, 
all the CAM directors who have managed to join us this morning, all the sector chairs, chapter chairs, Kenya Association of Manufacturers members, the members of the fourth estate, all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. As we all know, last year, the COVID-19 pandemic put a halt on a majority of our plans. We started January even as an association with our manufacturing priority agenda in very grand plans for 2020. But nevertheless, we remain optimistic that this year we will be able to achieve much more together and with all our stakeholders. And even last year, we were able to navigate the year because of the support we got from our stakeholders led by the Ministry of Industry who are very instrumental in supporting the manufacturing sector to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. So our manufacturing priority agenda for this year reflects the optimism that we hold as a sector. And our theme is from surviving COVID-19 to thriving, manufacturing sector rebound for sustained job and investment growth. It outlines the proposals that will support the robust economic recovery of the manufacturing sector and also consistent with the government's COVID-19 recovery strategy. The MPA is based on the five pillars that we focus on with specific proposals in each of these pillars. The first one is enhancing competitiveness and creating a level playing field for local manufacturers. The second pillar is on enhancing market access for locally manufactured goods, both in local and export markets. The third pillar is on promoting pro-industry policy and institutional framework. The fourth pillar is on promoting SME development. And the fifth pillar is on industrial sustainability and resilience. So we'll have in-depth discussions where we will discuss the specific proposals under each of the five pillars. And I really want to welcome you all this morning. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to your input and support as we drive the manufacturing priorities for 2021. Asante. Thank you so much, Madam Wakiaga, for that brief. And later on, definitely, we will be engaging further in the plenary discussion. Of course, at this particular moment, I'd really want to also urge you to kindly post your questions, uh, your comments. It will be an honor to have them even as we continue on. So, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers stands out as the leading business membership organization in East Africa. It plays a key advocacy role on behalf of manufacturers in Kenya, and not only in Kenya, but in the region, through its strong linkages with all sectors of the economy. At the forefront of this transformative agenda, please welcome the CAM Board Chair, Mushahi, Mushahi Kuniha, who will definitely take us through the program. And uh, of course, before you come in, just to let you know that before you invite Bona PS, we also have a PS EAC, Kevit Desai. So I'd kindly request Bona Chair once you are done, you can kindly facilitate that flow. Over to you, Bona Chair. Thank you very much, Johnson, uh, for the introduction. And I want to thank everyone who's uh, on the call for joining us today. A special thanks to our CS, uh, Betty Miner, uh, for industrialization, trade, and enterprise development, the PS industrialization. And the PS for the East African community, Dr. Kevit uh, Desai, welcome. As well as all the other stakeholders who are on board um, this meeting, we have our board chairs, sector chairs, uh, members of the public and the press as well. Thank you very much for joining us. We're always encouraged to see um, how many people are interested in this field of um, manufacturing, which is important for our economy and our country. So 
I'll just give a few brief remarks on the overall picture on the MPA and uh, Phyllis will later be taking us through the details of it. Um, of course, like we've mentioned, even in the title of the MPA, we are coming out of um, pandemic year. 2020 is a great year in history. I think we will all be able to tell our grandchildren that we survived it and lived through it. It's, not, it's going to be a very um, memorable year and a marker for everyone across the world. We are grateful to government um, for the work that we were able to do that year together. Uh, we had swift responses that were able to, one, control the disease, because we now know, as we see other countries, the ability to control the disease is going to affect your economy, your well-being altogether. And I think in that sense, Kenya, we have done uh, pretty well. We also had the business situation room, uh, specifically with our ministry. Thank you very much, CS Betty and uh, PSO Wino, where we were able to discuss our issues around manufacturing, and we were able to keep Kenya moving through a very difficult um, period. Um, and of course, again, government, we've had these MPAs. Earlier I was asking CS Betty, I don't know how many MPAs she has attended. Maybe she'll tell us later. When we launch our manufacturing priority agenda, we do this every year and government is always here and willing to listen to us and engage with us. And I think that's not something we can uh, take for granted. One of the things we want to emphasize, and we've been trying to keep repeating emphasize, and especially so in this MPA, is competitiveness. Because competitiveness is actually the bedrock of what we need to do. And all the issues we've raised in our MPAs, we are trying to focus them around competitiveness. So what is economic competitiveness? There's a lot of definitions out there, but I picked one from the World Economic Forum. Um, and the World Economic Forum have been measuring competitiveness since 1979. And they define it as the set of institutions, policies, and factors that determine the level of productivity of a country. So the other definitions, but all of them are talking about productivity as one of the key things. Another way to think about uh, what makes a country competitive is to consider how it actually promotes our well-being. A competitive economy is a productive one, and productivity leads to growth, which leads to income levels and hopefully at improved well-being. That's the general idea about uh, growing our competitiveness. And so productivity is very close to this, and this is about how we are using factors in the economy like labor capital and business expert expertise to produce goods and services. How well are we able to do this? And for us as um, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we want to see multiplication. We want to see that the labor capital expertise are being used to multiply. We need to see one becoming two or three. We have better systems, better speed of delivery, and even more pro, uh, output, not just for manufacturers, but for the country as a whole. But when we look at uh, how competitive we are, we see we have challenges compared to what we would ideally want to be. Specifically in manufacturing, we have the UNIDO uh, Competitive Industrial Performance Index. And in 2020, Kenya was ranked around number 115 of 152. What's important about that number also is that we have to compare ourselves also to our comparator countries. We may be slightly ahead of Uganda, Tanzania, East Africa, but our key competitors today, Egypt was 64, South Africa at 52. So we have a long way to go in getting our uh, manufacturing economy uh, competitive. What our MPA, our Manufacturing Pro uh, Priority Agenda identifies are some of the key issues we see that are hindering competitiveness, which is going to help us grow. Obviously we have our uh, objective of getting uh, manufacturing to 15% of GDP, but we have things that have been stopping us getting there. And some of those include, they'll be talked about a bit more, um, overbearing and constantly shifting regulation. The costs and consistency of energy. 
transport and logistics costs. I'll be talking a bit more about that. And a tax regime that sometimes we, I can only describe as it's voracious and sometimes even capricious. And these costs are all adding to the competitiveness or these aspects to the competitiveness of what we can do in our country in manufacturing. Currently, for instance, I said we'll talk about transport and logistics. It's one of the things on our table at the moment we are trying to address. We are having severe challenges at the port, getting uh, containers out. And the challenge with that is, this is where you could say overbearing regulation starts to meet uh, voracious tax collection. First of all, we cannot choose how we move our goods out of the port and clear them. But at the same time, the person who is charged with efficiently moving out the goods is not doing so. And we have to pay for that. If your goods, are, if your containers are delayed, you're having to pay for that. So you have no choice, but you have costs. And these are the kind of things that start making us less effective, less competitive um, in the environment, because it is both in increasing our costs and decreasing our efficiency. When we think about what we need to do going forward post COVID, we know we need to be more competitive. And especially so because I think competitiveness is not just going to be a Kenyan issue. All the countries in the world are thinking about how can we get more competitive post COVID. And so if we are going to be able to export and export is a key part and I think a key focus of what we need to do to get out of our current um, issues. We know for instance, tourism was a great source of foreign exchange and that has been heavily impacted. We need to replace that uh, somehow and export goods are a good opportunity for that. We know also that we have a debt issue and a lot of our debt as a country is in foreign currency. How are we gonna get more foreign currency to address this? We can export more goods and that is going to help us in our deal, our debt issues. We've identified, we did a study last year and, uh, on manufacturing resilience and sustainability. And we've identified 76 opportunities for export that can be grown, which we can pay attention to. We are also grateful. We know with the business situation room, with the ministry, we are having discussions around specific areas which we can invest in and work on and get big um, investments or things that can be scaled up that are going to help us in this way. But we must keep our mind on exports. And to export, you must be globally competitive. So that is going to become uh, still one of the issues within our MPAs. Moving on a bit, I think, to uh, taxation and public spending. In the past, at KEM, we have not really done a lot of work or put in a lot of commentary or thought on public spending. Um, but recently, I think this is becoming an issue for us because we see that the way public spending comes to us is that we are part of the funding of that public spending and it is becoming more and more a tax um, issue. Higher public spending results in higher taxation for us. We saw in the recent budget policy statement, there is an intention to raise taxes. And our experience is that we are usually first on the queue for uh, more taxes to be raised. And it's challenging for us as well, because even as we look at the uh, budget policy statement, not much of that money is going to be used as stimulus after COVID. I think we estimated it at less than 1% of it is being used to stimulate or to deal directly with the impact of, of COVID, which then becomes a double whammy for us. We need, of course, government expenditure. It's not to say government should not spend, especially after a crisis. And we need good spending that is going to help us get out of that. However, we all know the challenges of the high deficit that we have. And increased government spending can sometimes create challenges for private sector because they will crowd us out both in their borrowing and also reduce incentives 
for saving investment, innovation, and wealth. Further, you know, there is a limit to which we can be taxed and continue the economy growing because the overall economy is to grow. The overall goal is to grow the economy. But if we keep taxing ourselves, uh, I think as we saw a quote recently, you cannot tax yourself into growth. And the challenge we are having again with taxation as we've come to realize so is also the leakages that we have in, in uh, government spending. Uh, this has been estimated at an astronomical two billion a day. And that leakage is a huge disincentive for anyone to pay taxes. It, taxes are hard earned money, whether it's from workers, from uh, companies or consumers. It's a huge disincentive if you think you're paying taxes and they are going to be leaked out. So I think one of the challenges again in our MPA is encouraging government we really need to get a grip on public finance management because it is a downward trend. We, we are being taxed more and the money keeps getting lost. That is not useful uh, for us. Um, and of course, taxes that again, reverse incentives that have been given to manufacturing do become a challenge for us because we are trying to um, incentivize more investment but when we reduce the in, in incentives we have and increase taxes, we have a challenge. Currently we have, for instance, uh, our investment deduction has been reduced, especially for counties outside the big uh, metropolitan areas. We have minimum tax, which is a huge challenge, especially if, for people who had some investment deductions and also down our supply chain with our distributors and retailers which are going to be big challenges. And we'll be addressing those within our MPA. On the other hand, it's not been all bad. We've seen some good moves from KRA and government. We were able to get VAT refunds and continue to do so at a, at a healthy pace. However, withholding VAT remains a challenge with the majority of our manufacturers saying they have not yet received or been able to claim on their uh, withholding VAT. We've been proposing, and it's within our MPA, that we have a specific fund that deals with tax refunds so that government is not always looking for money. As we collect taxes, we should be putting aside the tax refund somewhere specifically so that it can be refunded with ease when the time comes for that. Finally, um, or just about to end, I'll say we, we are also concerned, and I think we will be discussing it in other forums and elsewhere about the, the political climate currently, and as it starts to heat up. This is never good for the economy, and we have historical uh, records of what happens as we head towards um, elections. We are hoping this time we can manage the elections better for business, so that business can continue. And there's a level of certainty and certainty comes from an understanding and appreciation that we are going to follow the set rules that we have agreed for ourselves. So we hope that those temperatures can be kept low to enable continued investment and stability of um, operations. So my actual final is on one of the areas which I'm proud of that we are, we are taking a lead on is on sustainability. And this year, we are going to be launching our Kenya Extended Producer Responsibility Organization. We started the process last year, and we are now ready to actually launch, and we have already started collecting funds. This is going to help our manufacturers take responsibility in the environment. We know this is our last decade of action towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals, and all manufacturers, uh, need to be aware of how we are affecting the planet, the only one planet we have to live on, to do what we, we are um, what we are doing as our continued existence is there. So finally, our we've put in all these ideas. We hope to engage with government, our key ministry there um, of industry, um, other ministries like EAC, uh, Ministry of Environment to get their feedback, get input, and also hopefully buy into the ideas that we're putting on. But we also know that ideas are easy. 
implementation is hard. And what we are hoping for is that by the end of next year, we'll have a good percentage of these ideas implemented so that we can have actual impact on the manufacturing environment. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Over thank to you, you so me. much. Buona, buona chair, I'd kindly request that you invite the PS EAC. Please. All right, thank you. Uh, well, that would be Dr. Francis Owino. Oh, is it Kevin? Kevin. <laughs> yes, sorry, Dr. Kevin Desai. Karibu sana. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and good, good morning, Waziri Betty Miner, my colleague, Dr. Wiener, and um, the CAM fraternity under the great leadership of you, Mr. Kumiha, as well as uh, Phyllis Bokiaga. I've uh, listened to your statement, ladies and gentlemen, and indeed we stand in solidarity with uh, the key concerns you have, but most importantly, that vision of competitiveness, which is really a shared responsibility between the private sector and the government. And indeed, the key issues with respect to transport, regulation, taxes, the vision that you have with respect to the growth of industry being based on export, most likely and preferably to the East African community and thereafter to the African free trade area. And the efforts that you've been put that have been put in place by the institution. I'd like to, to mention that indeed within our efforts as government and in particular on the transport sector, this has been an ongoing effort. Lately, we've seen a great partnership between the private sector, specifically the manufacturers and all our efforts as government in order to address systematically issues with respect to regulation, standards, policies, and so on, as well as identify key areas of infrastructure and innovation. And indeed, this has resulted in various reforms which are, are uh, currently being implemented. And indeed, this, uh, this value chain of reform starts with, you know, identifying the reform based on evidence and then going on to designing the necessary solution, implementing policy, and then finally ensuring that we have a shared responsibility to further promote it and innovate around it. And efforts to date, you know, including addressing the cost of the certificate of origin, as well as um, eliminating verification of stuffing. This is a recent development. Now, henceforth, they will not be any um, stuffing of export tea containers by KRA officers, the reduction of the physical verification of cargo, adopting a risk-based approach, the full, full rollout of the integrated customs management system. This is also recent development on exports. This is fully automated, thereby creating that uh, value of uh, productivity and competitiveness. On imports, there's ongoing work in order to fully implement this as soon as possible. But the overall development of um, automation systems and the, the uh, port facilities, implementing smart gates and other automation features are there to, to promote that competitiveness in close collaboration with yourselves. The uh, efforts that we've put in place with respect to the regulatory environment, and in particular, the duplicate roles played by various agencies like Port Health, Kefis, Skebs, and so on. And our ability to see how we're able to integrate them and ensure that through various efforts, including the single window, we're able to get approvals as efficiently and as quickly as possible. The ongoing efforts with respect to the upgrading of the Kenya National single electronic window systems. These are features and systems and structures which are all well within that systemic dialogue we have between the private sector and the government. Further to that, we are looking at ways in which we're looking at competitiveness of the transport sector from an end-to-end -end ecosystem, from ship to customer, specifically cross-border trade, and thereby 
promoting an avenue for exports of uh, produce. Our emphasis over the last year and uh, beyond with respect to our close collaboration with the industry on value chains, interdependent value chains that would maximize the uh, magnitude of industrialization in particular markets is ongoing. And in close collaboration, the dialogue has now shifted from simply advocacy to dialogue to actually partnership with a view of implementing reforms, but at the same time, identifying cross-border opportunities by way of the uh, export agenda and the manufacturing agenda. The efforts that we've also put in place with respect to our ongoing work within the borders of Kenya, specifically those that are linked to the East African community and uh, the inclusion of uh, traders with respect to trade hubs, which uh, address uh, social, economic and environmental issues. This indeed too will hope to amplify existing opportunities of access to markets across borders. And so these indeed are moments and times, and I'd like to assure you that with our efforts, we are looking at uh, all issues systematically. Of course, our manufacturing sector in particular, our export sector to the EAC is highly dependent on collaboration. The more we collaborate, the greater the reform, the ability to address these uh, wide ranging dynamic issues of regulation, standards, laws, rules, but also at the same time, look into systemic issues, which include infrastructure, coordination, information sharing, capacity development within the EAC to power the aspirations of the EAC as far as the manufacturing sector is concerned is, is a key initiative and, and imperative of um, government. So with that, I'd like to thank you once again and uh, assure you that we stand in solidarity with uh, the manufacturing sector. Thank you so much indeed. Bon appears that kindly, because of protocol, call upon Bona Chair once again to kindly invite uh, our next key guest as we continue on. But powerful words there, Bona Pierce, EAC. The more we collaborate, the greater the reform. Bona Chair. Yes, thank you very much, Johnson. And now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francis Owino. Uh, not a stranger to us and uh, our PS who's been taking care of us and our issues often. Uh, he is going to be the main holder of this MPA as we discuss with him. Karibu sana, Dr. Wina. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Johnson, can I proceed? Go ahead, go ahead. A cabinet secretary, Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, uh, Madam Betty Miner. Uh, my colleague, Principal Secretary for East African Community, Dr. Kevin Desai. The IMF representative, uh, CAM board chair, CAM board vice chair, uh, directors present, uh, CAM chief executive officer, Madam Phyllis Fakiaga, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to join you this morning for the launch of the Manufacturing Priority Agenda for 2021. 
the government is aware of the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the economy and the manufacturing sector. In this regard, the government has developed a post-COVID-19 economic recovery strategy plan to reposition the economy on a steady and sustainable growth trajectory. To support the recovery of the manufacturing sector, the government is committed to enhance market access for locally manufactured goods through the enforcement of the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya strategy and promote the purchase of locally produced products by ministries, departments, and agencies. And at this point, I would also like urge the CAM members to purchase locally and buy from each other and from one another to promote our local, local uh, produced goods uh, here in Kenya. In addition, the government operationalized the SME credit guarantee scheme in December to enable SMEs access finance from commercial banks easily. Further, under the economic recovery strategy, the government will set up SME and industrial parks through number one, completion and equipping constituency industrial development centers. Secondly, establishment of one-stop service centers in the name of Biashara centers at the county level to provide integrated services to SMEs. One of such centers is already operational in Kariobangi in Nairobi. We have already finalized the other centers in Mombasa, Kisumu, and Eldoret, which we will launch uh, in the course of this month. To improve Kenya's competitiveness as an investment destination, the government has placed emphasis in accelerating the construction of Dongokundu, Freeport and Industrial Park, as well as development of Naivasha and Kisumu Special Economic Zones. The government is committed to making the aspirations of the Big Four agenda a reality. Despite the hurdles faced, the country has proved to be resilient through the collaborative efforts of both the government and the private sector, as was alluded to by the chair and the CEO earlier. Us, from where we sit, is to call upon all stakeholders in the manufacturing space to work together for the betterment of the sector. I wish to congratulate CAM for the launch of the 2021 Manufacturing Priority Agenda and look forward to a continued engagement towards the development of the manufacturing sector. From where we sit at the State Department for Industrialization, we will accord you all the necessary support that is required from time to time. With those remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I now invite the Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, Madam Betty Miner, to make her keynote address and officially launch the 2021 Manufacturing Priority Agenda. Welcome, Waziri. Thank you very much, PS, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Mushai Kunyiha and uh, Phyllis for inviting us to join you today for the launch of the 2021 Manufacturing Priority Agenda. I actually don't know how many I have not attended as uh, Mushai challenged me earlier, uh, perhaps only one uh, or two. But I'm excited that CAM has maintained uh, this habit of uh, constantly engaging government and articulating uh, the issues that affect uh, the sector. And I want to assure you that we take it uh, very, very seriously. So I'm, I'm really encouraged that you continue uh, to share this, uh, this agenda. I'm also excited that today we are um, launching this uh, when uh, we have faced uh, major challenges last year as a result of uh, COVID-19. And as mentioned, it points to the positivity and confidence and uh, the go-getter and it can be done attitude of our business and especially um, the manufacturing sector and our SMEs as a whole. 
The manufacturing sector has always been an important contributor to our national GDP and critical for our national overall development agenda. It's a vital sector in the economic pillar of our Vision 2030, and it is integral to our medium-term strategy of the Big Four transformational agenda and as a creator of employment and wealth. I want to applaud the sector because despite this, uh, facing many, many uh, severe challenges in recent years, our output continues to grow uh, steadily year after year. The value of manufacturing output increased by 6.6% to uh, 2.6 uh, trillion shillings in 2019. And the intermediate consumption and value added rose by uh, 6.4, 6.7 and 6.4 respectively in 2019. In 2020, the sector began very positively, registering a, posi a promising growth of 2.9% in quarter one. We did, however, see some shocks of COVID-19 that uh, really led to a decline of nearly 4% in the sector in quarter two. But by the third and fourth quarters, the output of the sector had picked up once again, and the country recorded positive recovery, ending the year at a much better place than when we had found ourselves at the onset of COVID-19. This is a testament to the resilience, hard work, and the innovative spirit of our manufacturing sector. I'm therefore very excited to note that the theme of the manufacturing priority agenda is aptly titled from surviving COVID-19 to thriving, the manufacturing sector in a rebound. And that I think for me is also just a testament to the spirit of the Kenyan uh, business sector as a whole. I take, uh, I take cognizance of the fact that it resonates as well with government's post COVID-19 recovery strategy and our ministry's guiding principles and therefore provides us with a great platform to engage further in supporting Kenya's economic recovery. Our ministry is charged with leading the industrial transformation of our country. And our goal is to develop Kenya into a new industrial hub in Africa by accelerating the development of industries that will drive the country's economic growth. I'm aware that the sector is currently facing several challenges, including liquidity constraints, changes in supply chains and markets and operational challenges amongst others. As a demonstration of this aforementioned resilience and innovativeness, our manufacturers have been able to fairly outmaneuver uncertainty by correcting their course as circumstances have changed. This is very commendable that you have managed to seize opportunities occasioned by disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic to innovate in your product offerings in order to respond to the increased demand for COVID-19 related goods by accelerating production of essential goods such as PPEs, bedding, sanitizers, canned food, disinfectants, and immunity uh, boosting products, ventilators, and thermoguns, among others. I'm also aware that additional strategies have been adopted to maintain operations such as reorganizing your own uh, factory plants to accommodate social distancing, analyzing of supply chain modalities, and applying more innovation and creativity with sales and marketing efforts. And we have seen the results of your work. Last year, our exports grew by 30 billion shillings uh, despite COVID, and our imports declined by nearly 200 billion uh, shillings. And that must be as a result of the work that you have done in reorganizing and producing within Kenya. The government responded, as mentioned by uh, the chairman, responded quite quickly. And since April 2020, we have been implementing several measures to support liquidity and cash flow for our businesses, including tax cuts, expediting value added tax refunds payment of pending bills, and measures to increase access to affordable credit. I take note of the comments by the chair on, uh, on, 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 on the implementation of some of these measures and proposals are going forward, especially with regard to expediting our VAT 
refunds, and also dealing with tax administration for our businesses. And this things that we will take up as an issue uh, with the, from the ministry as we engage uh, with our counterparts. The impact of the economic stimulus program was felt. And you've all uh, alluded uh, to that. As the PS has mentioned, we've also uh, done our bit within government to boost demand locally by uh, implementing the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy within all government agencies. And that master role of more than 330 products has been useful for generating demand. And I'm very excited to note that various government projects uh, and even private sector projects are actually enforcing uh, by Kenya Build Kenya. Some of our current infrastructure projects uh, you know, are sourcing uh, from local producers, unless you tell us. Otherwise, at least that is what the contractors have told us. And it is something that we'll continue uh, to build on. We obviously want to urge the private sector to also uh, actively consider and actively source from Kenya. The remission scheme that you operate, whereas it might reduce some costs, uh, is actually still externalizing a lot of business. And I want to urge KAM to carefully review the products in that remission list and work with us to make sure that the local producers can competitively meet these supplies. The government has also set aside funds to grow critical projects uh, in the manufacturing sector, including the Kenya Industry and Entrepreneurship Project, the Kenya Youth Empowerment and Opportunities Project, the development of textile parks in Earth River and Naivasha, and the development of the Canadian Leather Industrial Park and support to the dairy sector, among others. We have also provided credit targeted to micro, small, and medium enterprises in the manufacturing sector, including the finalization of the credit guarantee fund and the allocation of Kenya shillings uh, 10 billion to set up the facility to de-risk lending to MSMEs. We shall continue to do more. And the work and the proposals that you have included in the manufacturing priority agenda, we want to assure you will be, you know, will be reflected on and we shall look and work with our colleagues in other government departments to address the challenges that you have raised. I take note of the issues that you have raised with regard to energy. I take note of the issues you have raised with regard to tax, tax levels and tax administrations. I take note of the issues you have raised with the, the matters of, you know, of regulation, of logistics, and obviously also take note of the matters you've raised with regard to political climate. I might not be able to do much about that, but certainly your voice and the voice of others will be able to add, I mean, will, will add to addressing the matters and ensuring that we do have a conducive environment uh, for business. As we look ahead, uh, where we we'll, you know, as we as we look ahead and as we continue uh, to work with our colleagues in, uh, in in other government departments, we believe that when we address the issues that you have raised, when we address the issues that we have identified, and we will all be able to work together to ensure that our industries and our economies can regain and can you know can can, can rebound and can gain competitiveness. We are happy that we have several advantages over, over other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I think you are aware that in 2020, our economy was ranked third in the region. We don't rest on this, Lawrence. We certainly know that um, we, we need to be competing uh, with others and therefore we, we are whereas we are very proud of the factors that lead to our ranking, such as our educated labor force, our financial services, our information technology capabilities. These are some of the most developed uh, in the region. Uh, some of you might have attended uh, the Africa Business Forum on the sidelines of AU Summit on Monday, where we were showcasing our capabilities uh, in IT. We're extremely proud of our infrastructure and more 
is being invested in our infrastructure. The LAMO port is almost, uh, is almost complete and we are excited by that. We also have you know, our vast agricultural and natural resources and we are some of the, we are the home of some of the most innovative entrepreneurs in the country. We continue to undertake critical business reforms which have resulted in an improved ranking in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, moving us from number 136 in 1990 to number 56 uh, out of 190 in 2020. And these are efforts that the government is undertaking in collaboration with yourselves and various stakeholders. We are aware, and then as we move up in this business ranking, that there are other business friction issues that such as the ones that I have, you know, noted, we have taken note of, and we will continue uh, to address that. But we are also, and you're aware that we have signed up on various you know, trade, bilateral, multilateral, and bilateral trade agreements, which also present us with an opportunity to scale up production, increase efficiency, and diversify our products and expand our markets. The newly signed UK EPA, uh, Kenya UK EPA ensures and further opens up the UK market for our goods and services and gives you a very predictable framework. The CFTA alone presents us with a market of more than 1.2 billion uh, people, which is uh, and a very, I mean, a, and a growing middle class. The African Development Bank estimates that the middle class in Africa is actually about 300 uh, million. Which is uh, which, 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 which really gives us a potential, a greater market, and an opportunity to domesticate and to localize supplies that are currently being imported uh, into Africa. You are aware we are currently negotiating the um, the US uh, FTA, and uh, and that should also give us an opportunity to give uh, have a predictable market after the end uh, of Agoa. And that should give you also signals of the investments that are required and the areas that we could localize in our country. It is my sincere hope that we will put all these opportunities and advantages to good use to spur the growth of our manufacturing sector. And I want to once again give you the assurance that the government led by us uh, with the, from the Ministry of Industrialization will take note and has taken note of the issues that you have raised in this MPA. We will domesticate it within government and together we will work to ensure that you have a conducive environment for manufacturing so that you can take advantage of these um, market openings and expand and for us to continue to see the acceleration of the growth of the sector as well as the acceleration of our exports. So I want to thank you for sharing with us the manufacturing priority agenda and, uh, and we'll continue to work uh, with you. And with that, as, uh, as invited and as you know, instructed by Johnson, I now have the privilege of launching this manufacturing priority agenda. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we celebrate the launch of the Manufacturing Priority Agenda 2021 under the theme from surviving COVID-19 to thriving manufacturing sector rebound for sustained job and investment growth. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Honorable CS, for really guiding us through that launch, Asante Sana. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the past one year as a country, we have had to review our priorities and vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to our economic resilience and sustainability. The 2021 Manufacturing Priority Agenda outlines proposals to support robust economic and manufacturing sector recovery, consistent with the government's post-COVID-19 recovery strategy. To give us an overview, Please, once again, welcome the Kenya Association of Manufacturers Chief Executive, Ms. Phyllis Wakiaga. Karibu sana, once again. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mwakazi, and uh, thank you, CS, PS, and uh, PS Dr. We know PS Dr. Kevin Desai for, for the remarks and also our chairman. It's always a pleasure to listen to the Ministry of Industry and recognize that we do have an advocate in government that really promotes the growth of the manufacturing priority and also the manufacturing sector in Kenya. So I'll take us through the slides in the presentation. Um, the outline is a look at the achievements uh, of the 2020 manufacturing priority agenda, a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on the manufacturing sector. Then we look at the manufacturing sector's performance and then dive into the 2021 uh, specific actions and the pillars, uh, the five pillars. So uh, we've outlined some of the achievements out of the manufacturing priority agenda and listening to both the PS and CS, uh, there are others that have been realized uh, that might not be listed here, but we just pulled out some of the key ones. Uh, one of the actions was to fast track the finalization of the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act regulations to address the issues on payments and penalties. And we saw this happen through the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Regulations of 2020 that were published on 24th July 2020, and they provide a payment period uh, of 60 days. The other one, that was realized was to fast track the finalization of the Movable Property Securities Act 2017 that provides the creation of the electronic collateral registry for use by Kenyan banks. And for this one, we did see the regulations uh, of the 2017 Act uh, come into force last year. Then the third one that I'll mention today is the adoption and gazetting on the list of locally manufactured goods for exclusive local sourcing. And this one, uh, we really want to appreciate the work that went into this from the Ministry of Industry, where we had the list of 334 goods for preferential procurement by all public agencies being published in the preferential procurement master role, number one of 2020 by the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development. Then in regards to the SME development, the implementation of the credit guarantee fund uh, was also uh, done in part where there was some seed capital allocated and we've had the commitment this morning on what is going to be done around the credit guarantee scheme. We also saw the VAT refund and improvement in the payment uh, last year uh, of, of VAT refunds. So we'll move into the priority agenda for 2021. Uh, the theme I think has been uh, said, uh, but it's from surviving COVID-19 to thriving, manufacturing sector rebound for sustained job and investment growth. That's what we are trying to do this year to see how we can thrive. Uh, as we all knew in 2020, the global economies were all devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic and we saw it take a hit on economies around the world. We also saw the balance sheet for a majority of households and businesses uh, being uh, destroyed or affected by the pandemic. Uh, the governments, uh, Kenya included, responded through the fiscal and monetary policy interventions to contain the impact. And we must say that this did help us to survive last year as an industry. And uh, the, the robust support from government and the dynamism of business and that can-do attitude that CS mentioned, did see the sector uh, make it through the year and also attempt to rebound and continue to grow. 
and uh, the manufacturing sector will continue to play that role uh, of, of, of creating jobs and really transforming the economy. So in regards to the impact of COVID-19 to the manufacturing sector, uh, it was mainly felt in the second and third uh, quarters, uh, where we saw a contraction of 3.2% in quarter three and 3.9% in quarter two, uh, compared to the growth of 2.9% in quarter one of last year. The value add by the sector also dropped to 183 billion in quarter three 2020 from 191 billion in quarter one 2020. And this contraction was witnessed in both manufacturing of food and non-food products. And we have a graph just demonstrating uh, that contraction within the manufacturing sector. Uh, government did have a swift response uh, to try and cushion the manufacturing sector, and we did see the reduction of some taxes, uh, which were rolled back this year, but for almost six months last year, we had a reduction of, of, of pay as you are, corporate tax, the VAT, amongst others. And then we also saw uh, some taxes being introduced, uh, like the minimum tax, uh, which uh, the chair did speak about, that we think is a challenge to the sector and will be one of the priorities we are addressing for 2021. About 15 billion was allocated for VAT refunds, and we did see this liquidity support businesses to be able to retain jobs uh, during a difficult year. And a stimulus program was also instituted of about 53.7 billion. Uh, that, that stimulus was, was a good thing, but it was a small stimulus uh, that, 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 that would have been more impactful, maybe if it was larger. Uh, and this, PD implementation of the credit guarantee scheme, I think, also needs to be operationalized in the course of this year so that we begin to see the benefits of this allocation. And as we move into the budget uh, season, uh, looking to see if a bigger stimulus program can be put in place uh, so that we stem uh, the, the possibility of a deep economic recession and uh, just to get the economy to recover much faster. We're looking at the Obama administration uh, and the failure to institute a big economic stimulus and how that affected the quick recovery of the economy in the year 2008. So we are hopeful that as we get into the budget season and as we look at our proposals, we can institute a stimulus that can actually result into a quicker recovery of the economy. Um, so in terms of the contribution to GDP, the sector's contribution in 2019 was 7.5% compared to 7.8 in 2018. Uh, we are looking forward to receiving the 2020 figures. Uh, the value add, as uh, was mentioned uh, by previous speakers, uh, in the manufacturing sector continues to increase over the same period of time. Uh, and, 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 and that just shows that there's a lot of potential still for, for strong growth within the manufacturing sector. And uh, the continued decline of the contribution to the GDP uh, is, is against the backdrop that we are targeting to have the sector contribute to 15% of the GDP. So even as the value add grows, our end target is to still see the sector contribute more significantly to the GDP of the country. On the next slide, I'll look at the manufacturing sector's contribution to taxes. Uh, we can see the um, agriculture, manufacturing, wholesale, those are some of the big sectors uh, in, in, in the country. And uh, if you look at the manufacturing sector's GDP contribution over the last three years, it's been 8%, 7.5, 7.2. Uh, but if you look at the revenue contribution of the sector, it's been 18.5, 18.3, 17.5, compared to, say, agriculture that contributes almost 35% to the GDP. But in terms of revenue contribution, it's about 2.4 or the retail sector that contributes almost same to the manufacturing, about 7.5%, but with a lower revenue contribution of 6% or 6.8%. And I think this is really testament of the imperative that the manufacturing sector is a sector with a high multiplier effect and with the ability to really contribute to tax revenue if it is supported. Uh, and I think if we look at that, that's a lost opportunity, that if we're able to contribute 15% to the GDP, uh, it would mean then that this contribution in terms of taxes would double possibly to almost 30% and really grow the ability of the country to offer more. So 
what we are basically saying is that the growth of manufacturing sector equals the growth of taxes and the growth of taxes should really not come from uh, overtaxing the same, but really seeing how we can support the sector to be more productive, how we can double the growth of the sector and that way uh, collect more taxes. In regards to competitiveness, the chair spoke about this, so I won't belabor, but we are really looking at uh, the issue of competitiveness and we've uh, kept saying we're at about a 12% cost disadvantage in terms of competitiveness. And we are also tracking the Competitiveness Industrial Performance Index with UNIDO and we'll be working with them and the Ministry of Industry this year closely to see how we can uh, not improve the ranking but really change the fundamentals that make us less competitive. Uh, in 2020, we were ranked as position 115 out of 152 countries and we've seen a decline in this competitiveness index uh, since the year 2020 moving I mean, 2010, moving from position 104 to 115. So we want to work on the fundamentals that can make us uh, more competitive because it's an important precondition for benefiting from the regional and international trade agreements. So I'll move into the priorities uh, we've identified. Our pillars, uh, if you've noticed over the years, we've zeroed in on these five areas. We tweak uh, some, some, some of the pillars, but primarily competitiveness and a level playing field, enhancing market access for industry policy and institutional framework, SME development and industrial sustainability and resilience are the five areas we focus on as priorities. And under each of them, uh, depending on, 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 on the priorities of the year, we make different proposals. If we are able to move uh, some of the proposals, we drop them from the priorities. Uh, but if not, we carry them on to the next year or introduce new proposals. So in the improving regulatory efficiency, uh, there are a number of proposals that we've highlighted two here. Uh, one of the key ones is working to see how we can merge permits and fees imposed by regulatory agencies to reduce duplication and uh, the cost of business. And then looking to see how government agencies can create integrated platforms to facilitate compliance and reduce the cost of business. Um, as we move into technology and uh, uh, using data and information, uh, we want to see if government can also uh, work to make a lot of these things online and coordinated and integrated. Then on quality, affordable and reliable energy for manufacturing, we are still looking at how, as we go through the tariff review this year, if we can review the time of use tariff to incorporate uh, the time of use tariff that was introduced uh, based on the learnings that we have had and the baseline, uh, and also to look at whether the electricity rebate program can be incorporated in the tariff review so that we have a lower tariff for industry uh, to reduce the cost of production. Then on reducing tra transport and logistic costs, uh, looking at how we can address the transport and logistic inefficiencies at the port and the Nairobi ICD. I know PS Kevin Desai spoke about some of the things we're doing and uh, this is an area we still need to address because we do have containers uh, delaying other ports and the cost is being passed on to manufacturers in terms of uh, damage. Then the other area under competitiveness is enhancing the cash flow for the manufacturing sector. Uh, we appreciate the effort and push that was put around VAT refunds, but what we want is to have predictability in that area. So we are proposing the amendment of the Public Finance Management Act to establish a tax refund fund uh, that sets aside uh, monthly allocations to allow for speedy VAT refunds. Uh, we are also looking to have the monthly allocation for VAT and excise refunds budgeted at about 5.5 billion so that we don't have the backlogs. Uh, also for the one-off payment to clear the outstanding withholding VAT and excise tax refunds uh, that are currently outstanding. And then also refund interest accrued through pending bills and outstanding VAT refunds. The next pillar is enhancing market access. Uh, uh, the local market, a big opportunity for my Kenya Build Kenya, uh, both for government to support locally manufactured products, but also for more trade amongst ourselves as manufacturers. Uh, we are also looking at the finalization of implementation and implementation of the local content policy regulations and guidelines. Another area that's important for us is the Kenya Trade Remedies Agency, the agency that has been put in place, uh, ensuring that we re 
resource it and capacitate it to be able to support in conducting investigations and putting in place any of the countervailing measures that need to be put in place to uh, deal with the trade remedies. Uh, then for EAC, uh, uh, PSCS, uh, we are keen to finalize the EAC CET review and see how we can promote value addition and industrialization. Uh, I think we agreed on the four bands, but really closing in on the fourth band and uh, all, all the issues around that. And also alongside this, the review of the EAC rules of origin so that we can support regional value addition and also fast tracking the finalization of the ESC and TB Act amendment and also the regulations around this so that we really have a strong mechanism around dealing with non tariff barriers in the region. For international markets, we appreciate all the work and efforts uh, CSU have been making to open new markets for us. And uh, for the Africa continental free trade area in partnership with your ministry, we would like to develop an advisory trade guide document that manufacturers can use uh, as they penetrate the continental market and also see how we can promote uh, the US uh, Kenya uh, Agora. We have five years, almost four years left of, uh, of, of the Agora until 2025 and uh, I know the negotiations are ongoing, but how we can capitalize and take advantage of the remaining four years even as we negotiate the post 2025. And also for the UK, uh, taking advantage of that market uh, that you have uh, opened. For SME development, uh, a priority this year is to enhance market access for SMEs uh, as we implement the list of exclusive local sourcing. How do we prioritize SMEs and support them to access government procurement and also ensure that we pay them on time? And then for enhanced governance, also developing programs in partnership with government. I know they are a number of programs you're running like KF and others uh, to see how we can support SMEs in manufacturing to formalize their business and also how we can train them and create more awareness. Then with the Capital Markets Authority also to reduce the costs associated with the implementation of corporate governance and develop a framework for SMEs around that. Access to finance also uh, working on that implementation of the credit guarantee scheme uh, so that we see SMEs begin to benefit from it, and also incentivizing the private incubators, research and development organization to nurture SMEs and startups. Our ambition for manufacturing SMEs is to see acceleration. Uh, we've monitored uh, countries that are able to grow their manufacturing base. Their SMEs are able to accelerate at a rate of 2.5 to 5% between being small, medium, and large. In Kenya, our acceleration is about 0.25. Percent. So we want to see how we can accelerate uh, faster. Then on industrial sustainability and resilience, our fifth pillar, here we are prioritizing the implementation of the sector resilience and sustainability strategy. Uh, this is the strategy CS we launched where we identify the different opportunities uh, that we can uh, run with. Uh, so we want to really go into those 76 opportunities and uh, work to get investors to invest in them, either to expand what they're doing or even for new investors. Then to ensure a stable macroeconomic environment, uh, they need to improve cash flow in government by implementing the proposed treasury single account uh, so that we can uh, centralize all government revenue and make it uh, improve the cash flow and reduce the need for borrowing. And then also the fiscal consolidation to attain the fiscal deficit of 3% to the GDP by 2023 in line with the ESC Monetary Union Protocol. And in line with this comes the reduction of government expenditure. Then for pro-industry skill development, fast tracking the operationalization of the sector skills advisory committees, driving the realization of SDGs through skills development and capacity building, and also being at the center of driving industry collaboration with uh, the pivot sector in the country. And lastly, on enhanced digitization uh, for the manufacturing sector, uh, we want to work uh, to support a well embedded manufacturing ecosystem of startups and technology hubs, and also support the upskilling of industry personnel on digitization, increase industry competitiveness and productivity. So, in conclusion, uh, 
for the priorities for this year, regulatory inefficiencies, the high cost of production and logistics, cash flow and liquidity challenges, uh, continue to be the issues that we must navigate and urgently address to improve the competitiveness of the sector. And a stable macroeconomic environment is pivotal for a speedy recovery of the economy. The fiscal deficit must be consistently reduced to tame the rising stock of public debt. And a stable exchange rate is useful in avoiding imported inflation and keeping public debt stock in check. Then we are very clear that MSMEs are the future of manufacturing and they fully support and they will support a robust economic recovery and job creation. And our SME hub will really be working to support more manufacturers and even to see how we can formalize a lot of the ones playing in the informal sector. And then manufacturers are hopeful about 2021 uh, that it will be a better year than 2020. And they commit to continue to do everything they can to drive job and investment growth. But we really appeal for government support and understanding even as we recover our economy. Thank you so much for listening to me and uh, we look forward to your support uh, as government, as stakeholders, as manufacturers, as we drive the priorities for 2021. Well, thank you so much indeed. And that hopeful note that 2021 will be better than last year. And of course, as we were told earlier on, in 2020, exports increased while imports decreased. We are still also improving when it comes to ease of doing business. So we want to celebrate everyone who is part of this webinar. And now we want to move on to that place where you can ask your questions. So you have an opportunity. There is a question and answer uh, section there where you can post your questions and I'll be glad to read some of them but as we prepare for that just to appreciate what Madam CS said you know we applaud the positive go-getter can-do attitude of Kenyans and this really gives us a feel of the that spirit that is in every Kenyan A few weeks ago, 300 tailors at this factory in Nairobi made clothes. Most are now on enforced leave because of the coronavirus pandemic. Those left to work are stitching around 20,000 protective face masks a day. The government has ordered that everyone must wear proper masks when out in public or pay a fine of $200. It's a job of tailors across the country to make sure there's a constant supply at an affordable price. But these young people in a neighborhood backyard on the outskirts of the city tell us they too can make protective gear for COVID-19 responders. They all recently lost their jobs as their economy continues to suffer. They've already made bodysuits like this one, which they've distributed to a local health center. Here they tell us this is an extra layer of protection and this is going to help me with it. And it also helps people avoid touching their face. Now, different initiatives have been started in parts of the country with local groups making protective gear and masks. It's just like having your house on fire. Anything you throw to the fire to put it down is good enough. Good enough. Our house was on fire last year, but Kenyans rose up to the occasion. Looking at the questions that are coming in, and we'll start with the first question. This is a question for... Madam CS, and uh, this is a question. It says, are there any plans to reduce cost of electricity to manufacturers because there is currently idle installed electricity generation capacity? Madam CS. Madam CS, are you still there? All right, Bona Pierce, perhaps. Okay. 
In the meantime, just to encourage all of you to send in your questions and possibly if we have uh, Buona Chair. Buona Chair, are you still there? Buona Chair, thank you so much indeed. There's a question here and I loved what uh, you said earlier on. You said competitiveness is the bedrock of what we intend to do and engage in. A competitive economy is a productive economy and productivity leads to growth. And so this is an opportunity for us to engage. And there's a question here uh, directed to you. It goes, what should be government's top three priorities to ensure speedy post-COVID-19 recovery of the manufacturing sector in Kenya? Buona chair. Thank you very much, Johnson. Um, I think we, we, we put together our MPA and came up with the top 10 issues because I think it is very difficult to say which are the top three issues that would change things. Um, the world is literally, it's a complex place and there are really no single civil, uh, silver bullets that are going to solve the, the overall things. There are three things that if you do, you're gonna have these things. There's many multiple issues that we must address to be able to move forward. But in terms of uh, recovery from uh, the COVID uh, situation, I think the number one issue, which everybody is saying globally, is managing the disease. So if we manage the spread of disease and reduce the impact, that was going to help us a lot because it avoids this whole issue of um, lockdowns and uh, inconsistency, travel bans, uh, closing shops or bars and all those kind of things. So managing the disease is the number one issue. And I think there we are doing fairly well. Then secondly, I think is about putting money, if we look at them overall, is things that put money in people's pockets. And that is consumers, manufacturers, etc. because it's consumers especially are going to be important in keeping the markets going. And in this case, you're talking about, if you look at what other countries have also done, is to put money even in the pockets of people who are unemployed so that there is some expenditure going on in the, um, in the economy. Because once demand falls, it might be hard to uh, take it back up again. And then maybe thirdly, I think, is to start thinking about businesses especially. Uh, and here it's broader than just manufacturing, but we are manufacturing, I'd emphasize manufacturing. You have to really avoid business closures. The challenge is once businesses close, them starting again could be years, decades, and some maybe never. So it's important that government is giving support to businesses to try and make them or ensure that they continue operating. And part of that, the key things in a, in a crisis situation like now is cash. How much cash does the business have? Is it able to meet its day-to-day -day expenses and pay uh, its employees, pay for its utilities, pay for some raw materials? So keeping that cash going is critical. And the, the issues we've mentioned around there were like the VAT refunds, the payments of pending bills, some of the things that really did help us last year and we hope will continue. But then now we are going into the area of taxation as well and start saying, if you start draining the cash from the businesses and prioritize government as the number one take of any cash that is available, we are going to struggle in the future. And that's both in terms of the new taxes that are being created, but also from borrowing from uh, banks. Those, I think, uh, top of mind would be the big three areas that we really need to work on. Thanks, Johnson. Well, thank you so much. Managing the spread of the disease, focus on things that put money on people's pockets, and of course, avoid business closures. Thank you so much. But before I let you go, Bona Chair, there's a question here from uh, Valentin, uh, Valentine Wabwire from Cooperative Bank. She says, Good morning. Which sub-sectors in manufacturing does CAM see thriving in 2021? Okay. Hey, uh, always hard to tell the future uh, from, uh, from here for anybody. But just looking at what has happened in 2020 and what is possible, we see uh, a lot of the food area has been uh, pretty good. 
construction has uh, remained quite um, resilient, even uh, in that in terms of the challenges we had. Of course, healthcare, and we saw even on the videos that you showed us, Johnson, the the making of PPE and so on, which is likely to continue um, going forward. Agriculture-related businesses; those are like you know uh, people who are processing for agriculture people who are um, giving inputs into agriculture, those have also done um, relatively well. And of course, people who are also re related to anything that is being exported and your packaging, etc., or even in the uh, processing of those things, they, they've tended to be uh, resilient. Um, it's a way to see, because we're also waiting to see how the global markets will behave and the Kenyan market in the coming year. But also at a reduction, I think we shrunk at about 3.2% was the latest numbers we saw. It's not too bad comparatively with other countries, but of course a challenge, especially for some sectors, um, footwear, uniforms, clothing. Um, so it's a mixed bag. It's very hard to pick winners at the moment. And for us, we are saying with our MPA, let's do things that helps everyone grow forward. Let's make a flow uh below which nobody falls that's the idea we have with our mta thanks and let's do things that will help people go forward asante sana uh vice chair come rajan shah there's a question here and this is in regards to the african continental free trade area somebody is asking here what should the government and manufacturers do to exploit opportunities under the African continental free trade area. One of vice chair. Uh, thank you, Johnson, and uh, good to have you here. Um, thank you. This is, I think, uh, and, uh, one of our primary uh, key priority agendas is market access. And as, as, as been already kind of discussed by the previous uh, speakers, we are we have to be aggressive and be aggressively going out and seeking what this new markets uh, potentials are. Now, what as a government we request that uh, we should be doing is actually seeing how we can be open up these markets. We look at what are our comparative advantages as a country uh, in terms of what we can produce and export and actually kind of start uh, even bilateral with some of these other countries uh, and, and start actually experimenting with many of these countries and seeing how we can actually go out uh, and, and ex export into those countries and see whether there are any, because this is still a young, it's still in the formation stage, we'll still see, uh, hit all sorts of red roadblocks, but I think the important thing is to ensure that uh, we uh, are ready for it and, and many other countries are actually already kind of starting and discussing uh, with their manufacturers, with their exporters, to see how they can actually uh, pick the, uh, these opportunities. And this is also what I believe that our government uh, should also be doing. Uh, and, and also more targeted, more sector-based, uh, where we have comparative advantage uh, uh, in terms of the exports into uh, the African uh, continent. And it's a big market uh, for the taking. All right, thank you so much, Bonachair. Indeed, we must be ready. We must ensure that we are ready for it. And um, moving forward, of course, thank you so much for the questions that are coming in. Please send in your questions. I'd want to bring your attention to the fact that we have uh, representatives from KRA, Kenya Revenue Authority. We have Hezron Ligale and Vincent uh, Kiptalam. I hope you can hear me clearly. There's a question directed here for you. And of course, uh, uh, when a chair mentioned earlier on, you can tax yourself into growth. Uh, it will be a critical moment for us to hear from you. Why introduce minimum tax? And KRA has the capacity to detect through audits and taxpayers who might not be declaring profits. Bonahezron Ligale, Vincent Kiptalam. All right. Well, definitely the question of tax is a critical question, but maybe hopefully they will come in later on. But there's a question here uh, for you, Madam Phyllis. 
Uh, this is a question from John Mbuthi. John Mbuthi says, under the SME's development pillar, you mentioned that a credit guarantee scheme has been established with a seed capital of 3 billion shillings. Kindly clarify if this scheme is the same as the export credit guarantee scheme under the MTP 3. Uh, this is John Mbuthi, Vision 2030 Delivery Secretariat. Ms. Phyllis. Um, thank you. Thank you, Johnson, for the question. Uh, the credit guarantee scheme mentioned is the one that was put in place as part of the COVID recovery last year. Uh, when CS spoke, she spoke about it and I think even indicated about 10 billion will be put aside for it. So I, I'm not sure if it's the same as the export one, but uh, the one we are making reference to is the one that was put in place as one of the recovery uh, support for the SME sector by government last year. All right, thank you so much indeed. And we also had, um, we're expecting Bonawanyama Musiambo, Deputy Head of Public Service. Are you there? All right. So for those who are still there, Bona Chair, Madam, uh, Madam CEO, Bona Vice Chair, I'll just read through some of the questions and then maybe you can pick them. Um, you can pick those questions that you're comfortable responding to, and then we can close this session. We have uh, Martin Muita from the Star. Uh, he has three questions here. The government took away power rebate benefits barely one year into its implementation. What is the government promising on cheaper power, noting they still rely on costly PPAs? Of course, that's a government question. Another one, say, uh, another question here. Treasury has proposed to cut the general economic and commercial affairs for 2020-2021 to 23.3 billion with industrialization affected. Won't this have an impact and development in this sector? Okay, another question here. What is the level of uptake of local content and what is hindering the process of buy Kenya, build Kenya, which started being driven years back, yet has not yielded much? Maybe let me stop there and Want to chair, Madam uh, CEO? Uh, any comments on that? Um, Mokati, I just wanted to mention that PS Desai is still on the call from government. So Excellent. maybe on behalf of government, uh, he could help address uh, the ones directed to to the government uh, specifically. But on the rebate, you're right. Uh, we had worked quite closely with the, the Ministry of Industry, Treasury, and other stakeholders to develop the rebate. But before it could be implemented, it was withdrawn. And uh, one of our requests, I think, from the presentation I made under the competitiveness pillar is for government to relook at uh, having a tariff for industry. Uh, and as they do the tariff review this year, incorporating either the time of use tariff and the rebate uh, into the tariff that they'll be reviewing this year. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. When appears Desai, uh, there's really several questions here. What is the level of uptake of local content and what is hindering the process of Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, which started being driven years back, yet has not yielded much? There's maybe one final question here that you can uh, respond to. There's one somebody, this, this is, um, okay. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thanks. The various questions been, that have been directed to government, I mean, speaking from a general perspective, with respect to the electricity, there are ongoing efforts towards uh, promoting greater reliability. On the area of doing business indicators, there's a concerted effort towards ensuring that connection times are reduced to seven days from a 28-day from a period. And this is primarily to ensure that uh, businesses can be up and running as quickly as possible. Ongoing efforts with respect to transmission, distribution, generation are there, and um, um, as we as we look into promoting greater efficiency and cost of electricity, the uh, questions and issues with respect to local content, indeed, over the last uh, 
couple of years, but indeed over the last year, there's been a tremendous uptake by government. Government is one of the biggest markets, consisting of almost 60% of the market, determined and uh, resolute towards ensuring that we promote local content. And this, I believe, has prompted and inspired many industry to to provide local content into government opportunity. Ongoing efforts with respect to ensuring that greater collaboration between stakeholders, specifically manufacturers, is there. With respect to the EAC, the uh, opportunity has always been a market, but uh, we're moving from promoting access to a market to finding ways in which we can create markets. And uh, this requires, as uh, the vice chair has mentioned, the ability to look at markets as a living thing, as an ecosystem. And um, the greater the market potential, the greater the uptake of industrialization. And therefore we need to look at elemental issues together on a value chain basis, on a sector basis. And this includes issues with respect to EAC policy, legislation, regulation, standards, look at the aspects of infrastructure, the coordination capacities. Now, all of this is the foundation for greater opportunity to markets. And we're fortunate that through various policies, strategies, treaties, the, gov the EAC's aspirations are based on those pillars of uh, uh, the, the customs union, union and the common market. And all of this, together with their aspirations towards industrialization, creating interdependent value chains, provides a formidable opportunity and inspiration for our existing manufacturers to promote productivity, competitiveness, and innovation in reaching these large-scale opportunities as a basis for further continental markets. These are ongoing efforts, and I, I believe that this covers uh, some of the key issues that you've brought up. Well, thank you so much, Werner Pierce. Many thanks for responding in that regard. There's another question here. Uh, this is um, this is Catherine. Catherine Gitao says, Kenya is blessed with a reputation, a beautiful environment, and citizens who are fairly open to environmental protection measures. Has the carbon credit market been considered as a possible source of income for Kenya, especially in view of the stresses on the traditional tourism market? And uh, when I chair, I understand you would like to answer that question. Yes. Uh, thanks, Johnson. And thanks, Catherine. A very good question on um, what we can do around enviro uh, the environment. I think one of the areas we're actually looking at right now actively is how we can get our manufacturers to measure their carbon footprints, because that's going to be the starting place. You need to measure your footprint, see what your saving is, and then try and get those carbon credits. I think there's a lot of opportunity in the green economy, even that as has been mentioned by other speakers, not just on the carbon side, we already, we've seen what we could do with solar power, for instance, and a lot of circular economy ideas that can be used they both um, create new business opportunities and also help us uh, use our resources a lot better. So there's a huge um, opportunity in there. There was the earlier question you asked me, Johnson, about uh, the, the budget being cut for um, the Department of Industry. I think it was uh, the general economic and commercial affairs being cut down to 23.3 billion. I think um, in principle, if you look at the big picture, our view would be that government, government budget needs to be cut generally, I think, and overall. If the government budget is not cut, we will continue to be taxed highly. So uh, how and where it's taxed is, is a conversation maybe beyond our pay grid. It's discussed at other levels, but overall, uh, a constantly rising um, a uh, government expenditure bill is not good for our uh, economy or for manufacturers because it demands a constantly rising tax take. And if we, if that cost is rising at a faster rate than the tax, then the economy is growing, we are going to really have challenges. 
as we do at the moment. Thanks, Johnson. So, so thank you so much, Wana Chair. Maybe uh, Wana P.S. Desai, there's a question here. You may want to respond to this. This is uh, Warren Ondanje. Says, hello, I'm Warren from ARC Ride, one of Kenya's electric vehicle fleet operators. What is being done to stimulate importation and manufacturing of electric 2.3 and 4 wheelers? Hmm. I think that question, Johnson, really, the chair, Mishai should answer because he's the one who's supposed to be encouraging people to create the transport sector. And I think it'd be great to have his insights. But as far as regulations and policy is concerned, sure. we're more than welcome. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I did see the question. I think the first question we, from the manufacturing perspective, is why are we not making those uh, here? I think that is the challenge we are going to be putting out is that we want to make them here. And you're right, there's a huge opportunity now as people start going electric. Um, there's also the accessories, you know, the charging points and so on. We need to start making them here. We already have motorcycle assemblers in the country, and this is an encouragement for them to start um, looking at those um, options for it. Again, um, we do need to go back to the bigger questions of the cost of electricity because that is then going to affect the cost of uh, running the, the motorcycles and the vehicles, depending on what you're having to pay for uh, the electricity. So the, the cost of power is an important component in that, that uh, needs to be looked at. But for us, it's even when we start talking about uh, uh, local assembly and local manufacturing, let's start thinking around what is coming up in the future and manufacture that. Thanks. Thank you so much. I understand we have Catherine Gitau, um, ICT Authority CEO, and there was a question. And by the way, for all the, uh, the panelists, kindly you can check the questions. And if you feel you want to respond to any of them, please go ahead. There was a particular question here in terms of technology. There we go. Uh, this is somebody says, uh, thank you to Ministry of Industrialization and come on the great work done to keep our economy alive. From the point of view of the ICT authority, we are encouraging local manufacturers and assembly of, of um, local manufacture and assembly of educational technology and the use of platforms to make economic opportunities accessible to Kenyans. What else, what else should the technology sector do? Madam Catherine. Madam Catherine Gitao, we also have uh, Michael Ngodo. Are you there? Okay, it was oh. my question, so I'm Go not ahead. sure I should answer it myself. This is Catherine Gitao, and good morning. Uh -huh. So I was asking it of uh, CAM and the Ministry of Industrialization. The question is, what else should we do as the ICT authority and others in the technology sector? All right, there you go. Thank you for that correction. Thank you so much. Sorry, Johnson, let me, let me just speak that one. Uh, yes, one of Vice Chair. So I think uh, as, 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 as a country, we are actually uh, adopting uh, technology in a very uh, good way. And, uh, and, we, and we have seen how in FinTech, whether it's the payment solutions, whether it's also at, uh, now the, with the reality, reality of the pandemic, um, we have a lot of the, things in the education sector, which are working virtually. I mean, the adoption of uh, internet is also kind of strengthening. So I think from the point of the fact that now we will need much stronger uh, pipelines, uh, band bandwidths uh, to be able to use uh, more of technology uh, and digital technology, especially and how government is also adopting. I think from the ICT authority point of view, we need to, see how we can also bring down the cost of uh, internet connectivity, uh, what, what needs to happen, what policies need to happen so that the cost of doing uh, digital business also kind of can, can be brought down. So maybe that's what we would look forward to uh, from, from the policy point of view to see how we can uh, 
make it much easier, uh, easily accessible also across the country, uh, which, which we know is happening even through the telecoms like Safaricom, how the ease of uh, internet connectivity is happening. And that's going to then embrace e-commerce and other uh, uh, ways of kind of doing business. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for all those responses. And we would like to close at this particular moment. Please remember, we have a press conference immediately we close. But before we close, just for your final remarks. And this would be one of P.S. talking about exports and how we can really push that spirit listening to Madam C.S. that last year we actually increased uh, in regards to uh, exports. And this is something that she also mentioned earlier on. Industrialization Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. says that Kenya stands to benefit from more markets as SMEs continue to innovate locally. The government is not just focusing on East Africa alone or cementing ties uh, with the UK. We are also working very hard to ensure that we can expand our markets in Asia, our markets in the US, our markets um, in Europe, and our markets in the rest of Africa. So, Bonapiers, moving forward, what's the picture like for Kenya in regards to exports? Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Indeed, there are efforts and ongoing efforts, but of course need tremendous support and collaboration in order to, to address this very dynamic situation that we're in currently. But elemental issues with respect to market access and the ability to create cross-border trade facilities, thereby in amplifying trade opportunities into the EAC and beyond are of um, critical importance. The, the improvement and um, the ongoing progress that government is um, fully resolved with respect to promoting the northern corridors and other corridors as competitive from end to end, from ship to market are critical there. If time issues with respect to cost of transportation to world standards is a uh, not only a, a strategic element in our national competitiveness, but also the possibility of promoting a transport industry across the uh, uh, EAC and beyond. There's, of course, the very important issue with respect to value chains and how we expand and create markets within the context of the EAC. This is primarily because of the progress the EAC has made with respect to its uh, focus and resolve. The EAC industrialization strategy of 2012 promotes you know, a more diversified manufacturing base, the promotion of local value-added content and manufacturing exports to at least 40% from the currently estimated value of 8.62%. Strengthening national and regional institutional capabilities for industrial policy design and management for effective strategy implementation, strengthening research and development, increasing share of manufactured exports in the region, growing the share of manufactured exports relative to total merchandise export to 60% from an average of 20%, transforming the MSME sector into viable and sustainable business ent entities that could contribute to at least 50% of the manufacturing GDP from a 20% base rate. The fifth EAC development strategy is about accelerating a people-centered and market-driven integration. Seven key priorities include the consolidation of the single customs territory, the development of regional infrastructure, the promotion of, of an enhancement of free movement of all factors of production, the enhancement of regional industrial development, the improvement of agricultural productivity, the space with respect to the transformation of projects and interventions aimed at accelerating a people-centered and market-driven integration. All of this coupled with various other strategies show a very strong inclination of the possibilities that exist with respect to the manufacturing 
place in Kenya, playing a more profound role within EAC. And it's with that in mind, of course, the, the, um, the objective of ensuring that we're involved in to illustrate further issues with respect to standard harmonization within the EAC in order to create a market that is accessible, but also promotes the necessary transformation and innovation from a manufacturing base are absolutely critical. The ability to harmonize policies, uh, harmonize regulations, th these are all central to, to promoting greater inspiration. Now, a lot of work has been done from the treaty to policies to creating the necessary pillars, pillars and so on. And indeed, our manufacturing base has also shown keen interest within the AC, but of course this needs to be extended and we need to constantly promote that engagement for the overall development of the manufacturing sector. So that's where our hope lies. But indeed the promise of 170 million people and a very consolidated uh, community, the EAC, and our ongoing efforts to in, in order to promote the necessary effective governance around the institutions that govern the EAC, the promotion of uh, better consensus and agreement capacities, and our bilateral relations. This will all assist us in ensuring that the greatest possible market exists for the transformation of manufacturing. Excellent. Thank you so much. P.S. Desai, we celebrate the fact that you really stayed with us even up to this particular moment. And I'd kindly request all the speakers to please hold on. We have a press uh, conference after this. But as I wrap it up, this is a comment from Sila Koske. Uh, Sila says, mine is a compliment, one to Lord come for the major strides. It's indeed true reflection of our resilience as citizens and manufacturers, despite the compounding factors such as COVID-19. The MPA 2021 is a reminder for us to do more by also increasing our country's GDP. Buy Kenya, buy, build Kenya initiative. Buy Kenya, build Kenya initiative is the way to go. Asanteni Sana, thank you so much indeed for being part of this conversation. And just to remind you, please don't leave for, that is for the speakers, but at least for all the participants, once we're done with the closing remarks, please feel free uh, to leave. But in the meantime, as we close, Please welcome the Vice Chair, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, Mr. Rajan Shah. Karibu sana. Uh, thank you, Johnson. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, uh, uh, Madam Betty Miner, the Principal Secretary for Industrialization, Dr. Francis Owino, uh, Principal Secretary for East African Community, uh, Dr. Kevin Desai, IMF uh, Resident Representative, uh, Mr. Tobias Rasmussen, uh, the CAM Board Chair, uh, Mr. Muchai uh, Kuniha, uh, CAM Directors present here today in this forum, uh, CAM CEO, Phyllis Vakerga, uh, CAM members, distinguished guests, uh, members from the fourth estate, uh, good morning, or it's now nearly turning, good afternoon. Uh, I wish to sincerely appreciate each one of you for taking the time to join in the launch of the 2021 uh, Manufacturing Priority Agenda. It is through your contribution that we have successfully developed and launched the MPA. As has been discussed today and was, uh, was alluded by uh, our CS, uh, uh, Betty Miner, that uh, Kenya would like to become an industrial hub. Uh, of, of, for this re region. It's very clear that the manufacturing uh, sector is what's going to be driving this Kenya's economic growth. 
the adoption of various action items uh, which will spur from this manufacturing uh, priority agenda will lead to higher growth path, in turn attracting local and foreign investments into the country, which translates to sustained job growth among other social economic benefits. As CAM, we believe that the manufacturing sector will recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and in extension contribute towards the realization of our country's development agenda. We have discussed uh, various uh, uh, the, the five pillars uh, for the uh, 2021 uh, manufacturing priority agenda. Uh, without going into detail, uh, the first and the most important one, which is enhancing competitiveness and a level playing field for local manufacturers is, is the top of the agenda. We are looking at improving regulatory efficiency, promoting access to quality, affordable and reliable energy, reducing transport and logistics costs, and enhancing cash flows for manufacturers to drive more competitiveness. This is simply means a good way of doing business in line with the best practices uh, from around the world where uh, countries are more competitive. Secondly, the second pillar is enhancing market access for locally manufactured goods, both in the local and export markets. As what uh, uh, was alluded also by the PS for industry, uh, Dr. Vino, that yes, uh, as CAM, we are also uh, driving uh, more uh, trade of locally manufactured goods between, uh, within the private sector. And it's already work in progress how we can enhance that amongst our members. Uh, our focus on this pillar is to promote consumption of locally manufactured goods and diversify our export markets through the various FTAs under negotiations. Thirdly, it's the promoting pro-industry policy and institutional framework. Creating a healthy manufacturing ecosystem is crucial for the sustainability of businesses. This can be achieved through sound policies and a regulatory and institutional framework uh, which fits for the benefit of the businesses. Fourthly, promoting SME development. For SMEs to thrive, we must address access to markets, access to finance and governance challenges. As CAM, we are cognizant of the fact that for any developing economy to thrive, SMEs remain the bedrock and we will continue supporting them. Finally, enhancing industry sustainability and resilience will continue to spearhead the advancement of a sustainable and inclusive sector through green growth, skills development in line, in line with the SDGs and the UN Global Compact Principles. We'll also nurture nascent and emergent business opportunities uncovered by the COVID-19 pandemic as has been demonstrated. Finally, we'd like, we are grateful to the government for the continued support in driving this conversation of the manufacturing agenda. Special thanks to uh, our Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, uh, Madam Betty Miner, uh, the Principal Secretary for Industrialization, Dr. Uh, Francis Owino, and the Principal Secretary for East African Community, Dr. Kevin Desai. Our gratitude, our gratitude goes to our members whose contributions has made the development of this agenda a reality. Thank you for your confidence in the association and we urge you to participate in sector and regional through chapter engagements as we continue to advocate for a competitive manufacturing sector. I would like to sincerely thank the CAM board led by the chair Muchai Kuniya for steering the association into even greater heights through initiatives such as this. Special appreciation goes to the camp secretariat under the leadership of Phyllis Wakiaga for their dedication and commitment in developing the manufacturing priority agenda. Our gratitude goes to each one of you for your invaluable contribution to the success of this launch. Whilst we are still continuously being engaged virtually uh, in this pandemic world, we hope that very soon we can also kind of be able to more engage on a face-to-face -face basis so that we can also have the social interactions and understand the pains of our members and see how we can advocate and 
make this into a very thriving uh, industrial economy that we all desire. Kenya Association of Manufacturers is always committed to working with all the stakeholders in the development and implementation of sound policies to enhance competitiveness of the manufacturing sector in the country. Thank you, God bless you, and please stay safe. Thank you so much. Stay safe indeed, and of course, hopefully we will meet face to face soon. In the meantime, we've come to the end of this webinar. I'd kindly request that uh, for all the members of the fourth, fourth Estate journalists, please kindly hold for a moment. We should be having our press brief shortly. In the meantime, you can actually share your questions via the chat box so that uh, once we are ready to start, we can kick off in a big way. Within 30 minutes, we should be done. For all of us, for all the, re the rest of the participants, Asanteni Sana, in the words of Bonacher, ideas are easy, implementation is hard. So that is why all of us must be part of the journey. Asanteni Sana and all the best. God bless you. So all journalists, please remain behind and appreciate your presence. For the rest of the participants, you are free to leave. Thank you so much.
Africa. Good afternoon all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, press briefing. Uh, my name is Grace Mbogo in the CAM communication team. Uh, so for the briefing, I will be joined by CAM, our CAM chair, Mr. Mushai Kuniha, our vice chair, that's Mr. Rajan Shah. Our CEO, Ms. Phyllis Wakiaga. Also on call is our head of policy research and advocacy, Mr. Job Wanjohi who can also respond to the questions. So our representatives will respond, respond to the various questions on manufacturing priority agenda and other manufacturing matters. As for our spokespeople, uh, some journalists captured stories from the discussion in the plenary session. However, we have a few on call, uh, including uh, mainstream media and bloggers uh, who may wish to direct their questions to you. As for the media fraternity, kindly send your questions via chat or Q&A sections. Please state your name and institution you represent. Uh, alternatively, you can raise your hand and we'll give you an opportunity to speak. So we will start with uh, the questions uh, by Martin Muita from the STAR. Uh, he shared three questions earlier. Perhaps our chair and vice chair could assist to respond to some of these. Uh, the government took away power rebate benefits barely one year into its implementation. What is the government promising on cheaper power? Not in these still, uh, they still rely on costly PPAs. Uh, question two, we have that the treasury has proposed to cut the general economic and commercial affairs for 2020 stroke 2021 to 23.3 Kenya shillings a billion with industrialization affected. Would this have an impact on development in the sector? And the last question from him is, what is the level of uptake of the local content and what is hindering the process of Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, which started being driven years back yet has not yielded much? Uh, we can start with the chair. Uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, which, which, you want me to answer all three or which, which one do you, you can, want to You answer? can pick one, uh, then the vice chair picks uh, another one. Ah, okay. I think we, I, I already answered the question on the expenditure, um, highlighting that we think basically government re does need to cut expenditure. And uh, we, we can't keep asking the government to spend more money and then not tax us uh, more. So I think at the stage we are now, we probably want less expenditure um, and less taxes uh, for us at the moment. On the power one, I think is, is the point that uh, we've been raising about a predictable environment, especially on the taxation uh, front, because we had worked very hard over the last two years to get to this position where there was actually a format and a way of um, calculating the tax rebate that we would uh, be able to get. But then it was again suddenly withdrawn uh, before really anybody could utilize it uh, fully. So that kind of tax policy where you're not sure whether the tax is going to be in place or not, or what tax policy is going to be in place or not, is really difficult for manufacturing. If you think about somebody who started manufacturing, uh, building or establishing a new plant last year, they are probably still not yet finished. And if they had assumed that that uh, rebate was part of their business model, it's now gone and they cannot be able to uh, utilize it. It changes their cost structure and so on. So we are calling for stability and consistency. If we get a new benefit or a new change, it should be able to last three, four, five years. Similarly, government should be telling us now, what is their long-term view rather than what are they planning to do just this year? for industry on some of these key incentives and um, areas around taxation, we should be focusing three, four, five years ahead so people can plan and start working out uh, what is feasible to invest in and what is not going to work. And also what the costs will be so that you know, what are you supposed to be charging your customers so that you're not having to try and recoup the, that money later on. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, the Vice Chair, please respond to the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya question. 
Then okay. we take the rest of the questions later. Yeah. Or if, what I'll do is first respond on the first one on power, just to add on what our chair has just said. Uh, there are two things. Uh, uh, this this uh, this power rebate was uh, meant to be a stopgap measure, and the ultimate objective, uh, which Cam had been advocating for, was a permanent reduction in uh, rates. But obviously, knowing and being cognizant of the PPAs which have been signed, uh, it was probably not going to be uh, possible to get that. But maybe what we should be uh, the the uh, the other thing that we should probably be looking at is that the industries which are major consumers of power, if we can have a, a way and a mechanism whereby those industries can actually be able to get a, a permanent kind of a reduction in power and become more competitive, then maybe we are also driving the agenda and being more selective, selective sector-wise towards uh, being able to achieve uh, some, some level of uh, competitiveness. The second item on the power, I, which I want to mention is that a lot of our members are now also adopting solar power as, as, an, as a green and alternative means of, uh, of, of uh, generating power. And uh, again, uh, the incentives which were originally available on, on, uh, on power panels and power equipment, uh, which were zero rated, have been removed. And maybe we need to uh, encourage the government to probably relook at uh, reintroducing some of those incentives back so that uh, more and more industries can actually invest into solar power, which will eventually be reduce their cost of power as well. On the third item, which is on uh, buy Kenya, build Kenya. Yes, uh, the, the journey has started, but uh, we, we probably need to monitor. And uh, maybe it's something that as CAM, we, we may want to kind of, we will look at doing is to see how our members are, uh, we can be able to track how much of the goods from our members are being uh, bought by various government departments and, 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 and have a way of tracking that so that we have more and more uh, ad, uh, adoption of this by Kenya, build Kenya. And, and uh, likewise, what I said earlier on, we are also encouraging amongst our private sector to kind of also build that whole by Kenya, build Kenya and, and support each other in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two additional questions from Martin Muita. I know that just spoke about withholding uh, VAT on his remarks, perhaps he can also respond to this and maybe uh, the vesture you could also add to it after he speaks. So the question is, what is the status of pending bills? How much is owed and how has the government made any progress in pain? Uh, related to this is how much is owed to manufacturers in terms of withholding tax? And what is the current budget that, that they have not in you want it increased to 5 billion? Uh, thanks for that. I think on the issue of the pending bills, I don't know if we've got some latest stats. I'll give that to Phyllis. I don't know if we have some any the latest information on how much is owed, but there was a big reduction uh, earlier last year. Uh, I think one of the challenges with pending bills is that they're not just from national government, but also from the counties themselves that um, all different suppliers. So that, that has been a challenge. On the VAT, actually there are two sides of the VAT. There is what we'd call maybe export VAT. And this is related to manufacturers who um, are especially exporting. When you export goods, they are zero rated. And any VAT you've put in there is supposed to be refunded. That is the VAT we've been asking for an allocation of about 5 billion monthly uh, because it continues to build up. Um, it builds up, maybe you get some pressure, it is paid but uh, it then builds up again. And that is why we are saying we should just have a consistent fund from which this is paid on, uh, is paid back uh, regularly because the money goes from KRA, it's sent to treasury and then treasury sends the money back uh, to KRA. That may not be unnecessary. Withholding VAT is a bit broader and it affects not just manufacturers, but all industries where we at some point prior to uh, was that 2019, we were withholding 6% uh, uh, VAT, and it applied to all companies across the board if you are appointed as a VAT withholding agent. Uh, the last figures we had around that was, um, I think, somewhere close to 100 billion that was owed to all companies, not just manufacturing, but all companies. 
And we've been trying to work back how that can be repaid. And there are some vouchers being issued to help manufacturers and other companies recoup that uh, VAT. So maybe Phyllis might have some um, more up-to-date figures on that. Uh, thanks, Chair. No, I don't have the up-to-date figures. Uh, we'll get to you, Martin, on, on that number. Uh, but just to mention that the current, you, you asked what the current allocation is for VAT refunds monthly. It's between 1.2 billion to 1.7 billion. Uh, but if you look at the projection, then what is normally refunded on both VAT and excise, it's almost about 5.5 5 billion. So hence our request to increase it from 1 point, about 1.7 to 5.5. That way you then don't end up with a backlog over a period of time. Thanks. Maybe Grace, just to add on, on VAT, maybe the, the area maybe we wish we are looking forward to is how, how uh, KRA can streamline. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I think the idea here is that uh, this is a manufacturer's own money. Uh, and, and ideally, just like best practices around the world, maybe within a month, uh, in, in a certain time frame, this should be, become available back to the manufacturers so that, that it doesn't constrain their um, their cash flows. So it's creating that system again, what through what uh, Chair alluded through a fund, but the fund should be sufficient enough to ensure that there is no refund which uh, is uh, outstanding beyond a month. Uh, and I think on the pending bills, I'm uh, as, as uh, there, there's, I'm, uh, there are still uh, pending bills in the counties, national level as well, through state corporations. Uh, which which are which are still outstanding. I believe uh, there's uh, it. We saw uh, uh, a report in the paper the other day that even the maize millers were owed for three years, uh, which hasn't uh, come through. So I, there there is still pending bills, which is hurting our manufacturers, and uh, we we need to find uh, ways and mechanism through which this can be cleared out quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for those joining in, uh, we're requesting that you either send your questions via chat. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and we'll give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, let me just go back to something that you spoke about earlier uh, today. So it was on the issue of logistics uh, at the port. Perhaps we could expound more on this issue uh, as we get more questions from the media. I can see Moremi is typing something from Roberta, uh, a blog, is a blog guy. The place yours, sir. Ah, you want me to talk about the... Yes, please. That, uh, what is Phyllis going to answer? I'll give her some. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, very good. So, so currently um, at the port, it's a, there's a lot of congestion. We are having um, issues and there are multiple causes of that. I think there's some manpower issues, some coordination issues, especially between the Ports Authority and Kenya Railways. The challenge for a manufacturer at the moment is that all cargo is being put on the SGR, especially containerized cargo, and you don't have a choice about that. But then there are delays related to putting it on, on uh, SGR. And then you find you're being charged demarrage because of those delays. So KPA, KRA is slow in moving the container and KPA charges you demarrage because your container has not moved and you are not able to clear it. So you're getting expenses, which are of no fault of your own, but you're having uh, to pay them. So we're actually looking forward to going to the port to try and understand what is going on and, and discuss how can we clear this backlog because it becomes very expensive. And what's still, like I said, is the efficiency because if your containers are delayed, uh, your inputs are being delayed and you're not able to manufacture, you have to stop your lines. And sometimes it's not because it could be just one small ingredient that is missing uh, in your whole uh, manufacturing uh, process and you therefore cannot move forward. And that starts becoming an inefficiency um, issue. So we've been asking in the past that, you know, when they have congestion at the port, maybe they should allow uh, people to use road just to move some of these containers out because the, the, the SGR seems to be struggling. 
Uh, we are not sure why, because they, they should have capacity on SGR to move these goods. But if they don't, they should use alternative means so that manufacturing continues, so that people are not uh, being penalized unnecessarily over keeping containers um, unwillingly, say, at, at the port gate. So those are some of the issues we're looking at on the logistics side, yeah. We can't hear you, uh, Grace. Bruce, you uh, sorry about that. Uh, this goes to you, Phyllis, from David Indeje. Uh, I'd like to know if this year's MPA is factoring in how it will work with other stakeholders to address how Kenya can competitively tap into the AFCFTA in relation to two protocols, trading services and traded goods. Um, thanks, Indeje, for the question on the AFCTA. Uh, which is a priority for us under the manufacturing priority agenda. If you look at the third pillar on market access, uh, we've actually included the Africa continental free trade area. And you're right that for us to be able to take full advantage of the AFCTA, we need to be competitive. And that's really the basis of uh, our priority agenda. If you look at the issues we are raising on competitiveness, uh, just ensuring that we improve the regulatory efficiency, the cost of doing business, and improve productivity, if those are addressed, that gives us a better and more competitive advantage within the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, but what we are doing directly is we are taking part in the negotiations. As you know, uh, AFCTA has come into force, but there are certain uh, document rules of origin, tariff offers, and other things that are still being negotiated. So we are part of those schemes to ensure that we secure the interests of uh, the manufacturing sector. Uh, within the MPA, we are also uh, requesting and proposing that we need to work together with governments uh, to develop an advisory document for the manufacturing sector so that we can fully understand the opportunities and what markets uh, that we prioritize and how we can enter those markets. Then we've also been doing, uh, we started a series of AFCTA webinars. Uh, we did one about two weeks ago where we took the manufacturing sector in partnership with other stakeholders. Uh, like the Ministry, the Kenya Revenue Authority, and others, uh, through the opportunities within the AFCT. And this is something we'll continue to do uh, and, and even carry out further uh, studies so that we can take full advantage of the continental free trade agreement. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Phyllis. Uh, let me give you one more uh, from Martin Mwita. Uh, what's manufacturers' plan for Lamo Port? Our major plan is to have it as a transit transshipment facility, but does it come with any benefits for local industries? Um, thank you for the question, Martin. Um, I think uh, for, of course you heard what the chair spoke about the port and the challenges we are currently having uh, linked to both the port and the mandatory use of the SGR. So any additional capacity that can uh, release the pressure from the main port in Mombasa uh, would be of benefit that way we can probably be able to move our goods uh, much faster through the port. So if the Lamu port uh, will be utilized and can release some of the uh, capacity at the Mombasa port and lead to an expedited clearance process, that would be welcome for the manufacturing sector. That way we are reducing the time it takes and also the cost because we are required to pay damage after a very short period of time and one of the things we've been saying is if we are not able to clear expeditiously, can we also increase the free storage period so that the damage doesn't have to kick in immediately? Uh, I mean, after five days, but have it maybe at 10 days uh, in line with the reality that it's taking much longer uh, to clear goods from the port. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Phyllis. Uh, if you need to share more questions, please do so on the chat as well as the Q&A. You can also raise your hand. Uh, we currently don't have any additional question. Uh, perhaps uh, the vice chair could comment something in general with regards to the manufacturing sector, the chair as well, and Phyllis as we close. If any question comes in uh, before we do, uh, we'll get back to you to respond. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think in general, uh, a lot has already been said uh, during our event. Uh, as manufacturers, I think we are probably uh, very simplistic in what our ask is. We are actually not asking for any 
uh, money, we just want to increase competitiveness. And competitiveness uh, can, on, uh, can only be increased through a stable and uh, predictable environment. Tax policy environment, regulatory policy environment. And that's what I think the ask is for manufacturers. I think manufacturers we have seen are very resilient as what we have seen in what happened in 2020 during the pandemic. They will continue to be resilient. And uh, we are very positive that uh, manufacturing will grow. Uh, but uh, of course, we need to continuously keep on advocating uh, to ensure that the cost of doing business, the tax policies, uh, stability and environment so that we are we can become globally competitive, just not locally competitive. Because at the end of the day, the, 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 the thing, the realization we have had from pande the pandemic situation is that the global, global trade patterns are also changing. So we need to take opportunity of those and be able to kind of serve in those markets uh, in a very competitive way. Thank you. Uh, Felix? Um, thank you, thank you. Um, just to mention that even as we go into this year and an election year, the need to have a long-term view, if we're going to support the growth of the manufacturing sector and the need for policy stability uh, for the sector. So as we engage with government stakeholders, we are keen to see the competitiveness issues addressed. Uh, there are those that will have extremely high impact on the growth and the competitiveness of the sector. And we are going to engage on those so that we have them addressed and uh, are able to grow the sector. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, our tax revenue contribution as a sector is much higher than other sectors considering our contribution to the GDP. And there's need to see how we can support and grow the sector uh, in a bid to see how we can also uh, increase jobs in the country and uh, uh, support the economy of Kenya. Um, so we look forward to engaging with all stakeholders as we uh, look at the implementation of our proposals in the manufacturing priority agenda. Thank you. Uh, Chair, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Grace. Um, and a lot has been said, I think uh, no point to repeat. The, the thing I've been emphasizing a lot or thinking about a lot is that all governments since independence have had a pro-industrialization agenda, but the impact of it or the reality of it, what we are seeing on the ground has not been as industrialized as we'd like to be. There is what I'd call um, fr a frustration of unfulfilled potential because we can all see what we could be, what the opportunities are. And the question we keep asking, and that is the thing with our manufacturing priority agenda, these are some of the things that we can do to achieve these goals that we've always been looking uh, forward to. We want to industrialize the, um, as a country. Um, we need to grow because we need to create jobs. We need to create prosperity for our country. So if the things that we've been doing don't seem to be working, we do need to start thinking new frameworks, new ideas. What is it that we're going to be able to do um, to make this step change because small changes, a bit of an acceleration is okay and it is good, but to get to say 15% means doubling our production and our manufacturing contribution as part of GDP just now. Those are big steps and therefore we need to take big actions um, to go there. And like Rajan said, and we are keeping on repeating, it's about competitiveness. It doesn't matter even if we can make um, Mercedes-Benz cars here, if they cost $2 million a piece, nobody is going to want to buy it. We must be able to produce competitively. And taking actions that help us become more competitive is the primary, primary ask of our MPA 2021. So that's my bit. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and Phyllis. Uh, to the media fraternity, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. I will be sharing the press release in the MPA with you uh, in a bit. Uh, and for our leadership team, uh, please be ready for a lot of questions once the media internalize on the document. So thank you so much and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who attended and their support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.